You may have heard the name Seneca before you think of, of the Indian name Seneca. I'm talking about the Roman, Lucius Seneca, Roman philosopher. Nero's tutor, by the way. He saw the, ro the rise of Rome to heights of power and glory previously unknown by any city or empire on the face of the earth. Seneca. You'll see his name from time to time. Many of his quotes have lived down through time and they'll pop up here and there. Seneca's Rome was the Rome to which Paul wrote his great letter to Romans. A city like none other in the ancient world. The city of the Caesars. It was an unrivaled mix of beauty and glory and wealth and power. More than a million in population then, half of them, close to half of them, slaves. A massive and generous welfare state for the Roman citizenry. A super rich class, the entitled, the poor. This was Rome. Spectacular sports and games. Beyond anything the world had seen before. Theater, arts. This was Rome. Seneca's glorious Rome. Forty, fifty years before Seneca, Augustus, the emperor of Rome who had unwittingly, unwittingly called the senses that caused Joseph and Mary to travel to Bethlehem, Augustus wrote of Rome, he said, I found Rome a city of bricks and I left it a city of marble. After Augustus, all emperors rushed to leave their mark in stone-cold splendor. And since the days of the Caesars, they have called Rome the eternal city, as though mankind can really do no better. Rome certainly had no rivals in the days of Paul. It was a city not only of glory and beauty, it was a city of excess. Prideful arrogance, gross, mind-numbing immorality. The Roman quest for pleasure led to infidelity, homosexuality, perversion, brutality, deceit. All of the things, it seems, by the way, that we celebrate these days as a fallen culture were really very much like Rome. It was Seneca who said, shame may restrain what the law does not prohibit. This was his hope. Shame may restrain what the law does not prohibit. And it was a false hope. It was his hope in the morality of man. Rome lost her shame. As have we. And if history teaches us anything, it's a people, it's a nation without shame is a dangerous dangerous entity. Among the emotions, few are so potent as shame. If I were to ask you right now to think about the most shameful thing you ever did, it would cause a moment of discomfort for you. You certainly wouldn't want it on the, on the screens. I look back through life and whenever my mind goes to those things which are shameful, I am so grateful to the Lord that He has washed my sins away because that shame that shame retains that emotional quotient. Shame is powerful. It's powerful. Among the emotions, few are like it. Nothing drives us off the scene so quickly as shame. You shame someone and they want off the stage. They want out of the limelight. They want to drift into the crowd. They just want to be somewhere else. There's a messianic verse in Isaiah 28, 16, many of you will be familiar with it immediately. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. He was speaking of Christ. A sure foundation. And then it says, He that believeth shall not make haste. He that believeth shall not make haste. Twice the Apostle Paul quotes Isaiah 28 in Romans, but he quotes it in the Greek. He quotes it through the Septuagint translation, 
And he translates, he that believeth shall not be ashamed. You say, well, which one's right? He that believeth shall not make haste. He that believes shall not be ashamed. The Hebrew says he shall not make haste. The Greek, he shall not be ashamed. Hebrews captured perfectly the motivating force behind shame. It makes us want to make haste. Get away. The whole idea, he who believes will not be ashamed. Old Testament, New Testament are in agreement. Shame makes us want to run. It's motivating. The Word of God exposes shame. It confronts shame. It refuses to ignore shame. Shame must be dealt with through the sin offering that we talked about today where that shame can be washed away, but it has to be dealt with. It can't simply be ignored. You see, our Savior has come to wash away the sins and to wash away all shame, but it's not a whitewash. He washes white. He doesn't just cover it over. He doesn't just bury it someplace. He literally takes it away. The gospel of Jesus has always clashed with culture, with a fallen culture. It always will. It's all about darkness and light. It's what is corrupt and what has been made pure. It's about unrighteousness and righteousness, unholiness and holiness. There will always be a struggle between the church and culture. The Bible says that Jesus came to utterly destroy the works of Satan. That the Word of God judges sin. That unrighteousness is not ignored. It is not passed over. And as a matter of fact, it is revealed. The second half of Paul's great first chapter in Romans centers on the fact that God's wrath is revealed against all unrighteousness. That is a troublesome truth in a culture that touts tolerance as its crowning virtue. When you say, well, we're just going to be tolerant of all of these things, and yet God, who's greater than all political systems or all earthly power, God says, my wrath is going to be released against this. It doesn't matter what you decide you're going to tolerate. Ultimately, God has spoken judgment on those things that are unrighteous. His wrath is revealed. Paul's message, when he preached this counterculture message, when he spoke to the Jews about a crucified Messiah. They didn't understand that. When he, sh- when he spoke to the, the Greeks about this treasure house of knowledge, he, they didn't really understand that. And when he talked to the Romans about the glory of the cross, they had no concept of, of really what all of those things met or, or meant. Paul's gospel was almost always met with either, either indifference or derision or hostility. But you see, Paul was convinced that the greatest power in the earth was not a marble city, nor a worldwide empire, not a philosophy, not some accumulated treasure, not political systems or tolerant compromises. Paul believed that the greatest power on the face of the earth was, the, was this power of the gospel. The preaching of the truth concerning Jesus. The context for Paul's writing to the Romans in the first place was his earnest desire to go to them, to go to Rome and preach the gospel. He believed its power was absolute to the transformation of culture. And so Paul was ready to march boldly into the lion's den. And I pick up my reading in Romans chapter 1 and verse 8, and we'll read through 16. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, 
that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I don't want you to be unaware, brethren. I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I'm a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. Father, I pray that you would etch these words in our hearts and that we would ask ourselves the hard questions this morning. Let those four words Paul spoke echo in our hearts. I am not ashamed. And help us, I pray, Lord, as we look closer at the Scripture, in Jesus' name, amen. Taking a closer look, I look first at the messenger, and then next week we're going to look at the message from the passage. First the messenger, and then the message itself. The messenger, of course, is Paul. While Paul was a scholar and a well-traveled man, Rome was like nothing he had ever known before. His ministry had been provincial. Places like Lystra, Derby, Iconium. Ephesus was a larger center, but again, not massive by any, by any scale. He had seen the larger centers of Athens and Corinth. He'd seen what Greece had to offer, but neither could compare to Rome in its power, its beauty, its sheer force. It would be like you and I spending all of our time in the Midwest in middle-sized cities of under 500,000 and then suddenly to transplant ourselves into the center of New York City or Chicago. Suddenly you're dealing with different scope and a different scale. You're dealing with a different world in a sense. And Paul had never seen anything like Rome. The world had never seen anything like Rome. Yet it seems Paul had no reservations concerning this big city at all. Why not? Why not? Well, as I look at the text, first take, take note of this. Paul was already invested through prayer. He was already invested in the journey. He was invested in Rome. He was ready for Rome. He was already prepared because of prayer. Verses 9 and 10, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Paul had been praying for the Romans before he ever took his first step to go to Rome, before he was able to depart in all of that, he laid a foundation first in prayer. Rome, it seems, is a constant theme in his praying. Prayer is groundwork. Groundwork. Prayer is the turning of the soil. It's the preparation it's the preparation of the soil for the seed. It's getting ready for a harvest. Prayer is spade work. Prayer is putting in the plow. Prayer is turning over the ground and making it ready. That's what prayer is all about. It's the bedrock of faith and confidence. If a man has not prayed, that man has not prepped. Let me tell you, it's one thing to write a sermon. I've been writing sermons for years now, more than three decades. Writing sermons is one thing. Putting it down on paper, putting the outline together, finding the points of transition, looking for the thread that draws your attention all the way through the, the message. I, see, I can see all of those things clearly and walk through that process, but far more important than the sermon is preparation. 
You say, well, you just talked about that. No, no, no. I'm talking about prayerfully coming before the Lord and saying, what is it that you would say in this hour to the church? What is it that you would say in this moment to the church? And brothers and sisters, I prepare myself diligently, not simply in the notes and the structure and the outline, but in that foundation of prayer. Lord, what is it that you want? What is it that you want to say? I can tell you, it's easy. It's always easy to come up with something to say. But if it's not what he is saying to the church in these moments, then it's for naught. How do we find out what God is saying to the church? We live in a spirit of prayer. Before we ever go there, we are invested in prayer. If a man's not prayed, he's not prepped, he's not armed, he's not ready. Some of you are getting ready to go to South Africa and you've got preparation. Some of you have different responsibilities that you're wrestling with, getting your arms. Let me t South African team, let me tell you the most important thing that you can do now in your preparation is pray. It's pray. I would recommend that you talk to Pastor Tom, get pictures of the faces of the children. He'll give them to you all digitally. Give pictures of the faces of the children from the years past. Many of them will be back. This will be our fourth shot at them. Get the pictures of the faces of these children and begin to pray over them. And if you go, having prepared yourself, God will, God will bring those divine opportunities across your path. It will shock you how the Lord will use you if you prepare your your heart for what he has for you. Paul was invested through prayer. Nehemiah is one of my favorite characters in all of the Old Testament. Nehemiah was an exiled Jew in Persia who was taken by the Persians and raised up in the government until he became the cupbearer to the king, while still a servant of the king, one of influence and of certain power. He heard, while he was the cupbearer of the king, he heard stories of the plight of the remnant that had been left behind in Jerusalem, and they were the dregs. It was the bottom of the barrel. The intelligentsia had been deported. They'd been taken in exile into Babylon. The, the wisest men, their, their religious core, all, everything had been exported, and they left the city full of the weakest and the beggars and well, the lesser. They left Jerusalem unguarded. They left its walls down. It was absolutely destroyed. And so the children of Abraham that were still living within Jerusalem or within that region were severely oppressed. And word of it came to Nehemiah. And in the midst of this, God began dealing with his heart. He was brokenhearted when he heard of the ruin of his homeland and his wrecked home city. He wanted to know what was going on in Jerusalem. They told him, and Scripture simply says in Nehemiah, they that he sat down and he wept and he mourned for certain days and he fasted and he prayed before the God of heaven. Often when we tell the story of Nehemiah, we tell about him going and rebuilding the walls and everything, that, riding around the city, taking a survey, getting everyone to work together, the priest working on their little part and, and the home builder working on his part and everyone works together and it worked out and they got the wall done in 52 days and we look at all of that, but we run past the first chapter in Nehemiah that tells us so very clearly before Nehemiah even began, before he took his first step, he wept and he fasted and he prayed. And if you look in Nehemiah chapter 1 and Nehemiah chapter 2, you'll find two months. Two months are listed there which clearly indicate for us from the time that Nehemiah first heard about the wall until the time that Nehemiah asked the king for permission to go to Jerusalem to do something about it, there passed a period of three months. He prayed, he fasted, he wept, he was brokenhearted in his prayer life for three months. Most of us would have organized Nehemiah just a little bit faster. Most of us would have appointed a committee along the way. Most of us would have made sure that we had talked to all of the right people and set the stage just so. Nehemiah, it seems, gives himself to prayer, seeking the Lord and waiting for that one moment of opportunity. You can read about it. It's all there for you in Nehemiah. It's fascinating where there is a moment and the king says, why are you sad in my presence? And Nehemiah, the scripture says, in that moment prayed one more time. It was one of those real quick prayers because when the king says, why are you sad in my presence? That's, by the way, that was cause for you to be killed. 
while the Persian king said, why are you sad in my presence? And the Bible says, Nehemiah prayed one more time, God, give me favor. And, and he asked. But he asked after the ground had been prepared for a period of three months. We call William Carey the father of modern missions. William Carey was a shoemaker born in 1761 in England. When he shared his passion for India with his church's foreign missions board, they laughed him into the streets and quickly issued a paper explaining why the Indian man could not and should not be saved. Kerry went to India anyway. He influenced that nation. He had incredible, he had incredible uh, just effective ministry in what he did. But even more so, William Carey reshaped the way that Western civilization looked at missions. And today we look around the world and we see great missions movements and we see people going and we see people coming. We have to understand that in the early 1700s this was a rarity. And there were whole segments of the world that no one thought were worth reaching. William Carey. You see, while he was a cobbler's apprentice, he was fascinated by reading as most those of those in Britain, he was fascinated by reading Captain Cook's explorations of the world. And as he was hearing about the explorations of the world and the peoples of the world, he cobbled together from, from scraps of shoe leather, he cobbled together a leather globe. And he drew as best he could the continents on that globe. And daily he would sit with that leather globe in his hands and in his prayer time he would pray for the nations of the world. It is said that Carey wept so much over the nations of the world and as God spoke to his heart wept so much over India that his tears washed away the ink and he just continued to turn that leather globe in his hands praying God God send me as a missionary to India and before he ever before he ever set his foot in India he was invested there in prayer at times at times, I think we're living life as though it were just something that's going to happen to us. Rather than recognizing that God has put within our hearts, stirred within our hearts, passions, at least He wants to. And when our hearts are touched, and when we feel the direction of God, we need to be praying about You say, well, how do I get to the point where I even feel God's direction in my life? Pray! Pray! It's as we are invested in prayer that God will speak to us and that the way will be made for us and that the door will be open for us and that opportunity will be given to us to have dramatic impact even within our own world, within our own culture. But if we are not first invested in prayer, everything else we do is a waste. What stirs your heart? Be praying about it. I realized several months ago I, I really needed to begin praying about the last 20 years or so of my ministry life. I'm, I'm assuming that I'm not going to be in a full-time pastorate late into my 70s. I'm assuming that. I began to pray, Lord, what is it that you want me to yet do? At this stage in my life, I need to be preparing for whatever it is He has for me. You know this? He's not going to send me a brochure. There it is. Sign up. Got it all laid out. Here's the brochure. No, no. It's through praying and seeking the Lord that He brings direction into our lives. How much are you praying about your tomorrows? Or have you just settled? Have you looked around, just assessed your circumstances and said, well, this is it. This is as far as I go. This is as much as I do. This is what my family is going to look like. This is what my future is going to look like. I'm going to live this long. I want to make sure i got all my insurances in place, and I want to make sure that I take care of stewardship issues. I want to cover all of my bases. But have you taken the time to say, Lord, what do you yet want me to do? And if you are not praying about that, you will miss God's open door.
We need to be invested in prayer. And as we are invested in prayer, God will speak. It is no mystery that the church, having lost its priority to touch God in prayer, has lost the ability to touch the world with power. Prayer is at the very core. Paul was invested in prayer. Secondly, he was eager to engage. He was eager to engage. He says, I long, in verse 11, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. Verse 13, now I want to come to you. I do not want to, I don't, don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you. Paul's eager. He wants to be there. Paul wasn't running from the fallen and wicked culture of Rome. He was running to it. Eager to engage it. He wanted to bless the church. He wanted to strengthen the church. But his highest aspiration was this, to preach the gospel in the church and out of the church, to preach the gospel in Rome, verse 15. Is our faith marked by such eagerness or reluctance? Do we see opportunity or do we only see the obstacles? Are we more convinced of the badness of the world than the goodness of God? It's out of the prayerful life that anticipation rises until even the battle is welcomed. You all know the story of David and Goliath? I think most of you could tell me all of the key bits and pieces. We could put it all together. I'll quiz you this morning and we'll just kind of see. I think we'd account quite well for ourselves in knowing the story of David and Goliath. How David was rather unwelcomed in the camp when he showed up. His brothers weren't especially happy to see him, especially when David began to shame them just a little bit. Wondering why somebody hadn't marched across the valley and dispensed with this devil. You remember? His brothers were upset with him. Goliath coming out every day for 40 days and challenging the children of Israel Saul desperately casting around, trying to find someone to go take on the giant. He offered his daughter in marriage. He offered a life free from taxes to any... Now that would be a deal. That would be a deal, wouldn't it? I'd I'd bid on that. A life free of taxes. Anyone who would go take on Goliath. He also offered his armor. You remember his armor didn't fit so well? Remember David selecting the five stones? Remember what he said? You come to me with sword and spear, I come to you in the name of the Lord. We remember all of that, but it's obscure and we often, we often pass over it, but I think it is so important and it speaks, it speaks to us. If you look at verse 48, this is 1 Samuel 17, 48, it says, So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. That to me is a wonderful verse. David hurried and he ran. David was prepared, he was engaged, he was a worshiper, and he was eager to stand for God. Well, what made David so bold? Well, he had testimony. Isn't that what he told Saul? Saul couldn't figure out this young man. I'd be scratching my head too. Who is this kid out of nowhere who comes walking in here talking so big and shows more courage than the captains in my army? Who, Who is this kid? What has he ever done? And you remember what David told Saul? David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep and when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. When it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Understand what David is saying and where his eagerness came from. David said, the Lord has delivered me. The Lord will deliver me. Somebody say amen. The Lord has delivered me. The Lord will deliver me. 
we often do not go back and rehearse the victories that God has given to us. And because we divorce ourselves from those things, we take new challenges as if they are just that, new challenges. We need to understand that the Lord opens a door before us, asks us to step through us, and promises that He will be with us as He has always been with us. We need to tap into testimony. Paul had a life full of testimony. He had taken the gospel into most hostile circumstances. He had already, already laid down his life for it. He'd been stoned and left for dead in Lystra, imprisoned and beaten in Philippi. Paul looked at life and he said this, The Lord has delivered me. The Lord will deliver me. I wonder, where's our eagerness? Where's our confidence? Do we really believe the gospel? Have we ever tried it? Have we ever tried it? I was reading an old book this week, James Vaughn, an Anglican rector, from the year 1877, a collection of sermons that he preached to, at Christ Church in, in Brighton, England. Anglican, I was stunned, stunned by what I read. I pulled a quote. He said, we all know that what is needed to give boldness to a man's bearing and a holy confidence to his tone and liberty to his speech and resolution to his heart is a personal conviction and an inner testimony of the truth which he professes. And then he said, I'm not surprised at the half-heartedness many of, uh, of many of you about your religion, at your compromises and your falterings and your petty fears because you've really never felt the thing. And that line just drilled me. You've never really felt the thing. What was he saying? He's saying it's when you have a personal experience with the presence and power of God, you can never be the same. And when you tap into what he has done, who he is, what he has promised, how he has moved in your life, what he is saying, when you tap into what he has done, you suddenly find the strength to step outside of yourself and do whatever it is he sets you up for. Vaughn was addressing a congregation whose religion did not escape the pew to engage the world in any way. He was talking to people who had a form of godliness but denied its power. And he was talking across time to any church where Christ is acknowledged as the keeper of some private inner garden of the soul rather than the living message an epistle written on our hearts to be read of all men. Unless Christ is our very reason for being, His message in us will be so distorted the world won't know what to make of it. It's no wonder there's a lack of eagerness to proclaim Christ if He is anything less than the risen, living, ruling Lord of our lives. Where, there, where He is Lord, there is no question. Where His Lordship is question, we have only questions. Where a tepid profession of faith has replaced a passionate love for Jesus, and this is too often the cause in this our incarnation of, of the church in our age, in this Western culture, it's just too often the case that all of the emphasis is on some tepid profession of faith rather than a passionate love for Jesus. Whenever that is the case, we find inadequate motivation for even the mere performance of Christian duty. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. To live is Christ, and when living is Christ, 
will not lack eagerness even to storm the gates of hell. Paul was invested through prayer. He was eager to engage. He was unintimidated by culture. Paul was a man of blended cultures. He was not only cross-cultural, he was kind of transcultural. Paul was, was a man really who touched and grew up in, came from, was steeped in three worlds. He was a Jew raised in Greek culture as a Roman subject. He came across in this, he came along in this window of time where all of that was possible in a small geographic location. A Jew raised in Greek culture enjoying Roman citizenship. He knew what each culture valued and presented Christ as the ultimate expression of that value. Ravi Zacharias notes this cross-cultural aspect of Paul's ministry. It's one of the most profound things I think I ever heard Ravi just unpack. He said, The pursuit of the Hebrews was idealized and symbolized by light. For the Jews, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. If you study the Jews, you walk your way through, through uh, the, the Old Testament, you will find that the idea of God bringing revelation is always within the context of light. And that's why the Jews struggled so much with the cross because there was no light in the cross. They couldn't make sense. They couldn't find light in a crucified Messiah. What good was a crucified Messiah? It simply made no sense to them. And so as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.23, it became their stumbling block. The pursuit of the Greeks was symbolized by knowledge. And the resurrection invited their mocking and derision. You remember Paul was doing quite well on Mars Hill in Athens as he spoke to the philosophers. Paul was connecting. Paul was making ground. But when he spoke to them of the resurrection, suddenly, the resurrection, they thought he was just a little bit nuts. For most of them, not all of them, because Paul had some fruit in Athens, but for most of them, it was just a bridge too far. The cross was then to the Greek mere foolishness, and isn't that what Paul says when he writes in 1 Corinthians 1.23, stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Greeks. Paul was convinced, by the way, that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Colossians says, all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ. For the Romans, well, it was all a quest for power. It was about the power of the city of Rome and the glory of the city of Rome and the glory of conquest. It was the glory of the sheer exercise of power. And so here we have Paul, Jewish by birth, citizen of Rome, Raised and for the most part living in Greek culture. And he writes in 2 Corinthians, It is the God who caused the light to shine out of darkness, who has caused His light to shine in our hearts. Watch Him bridge three cultures here to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of the Lord Jesus. Paul speaks to the Jews, he speaks to the Hebrews, he speaks to the Greeks. He says, whatever it is that you have placed at the pinnacle, at its highest and its best, Christ is the ultimate expression. And believe me, even in these postmodern times, as people are searching and trying to find something that answers the needs of their heart, the broken places of the soul, don't you be intimidated by this culture. They are simply as lost as the cultures that have come before them and the gospel is not ill-equipped to reach the culture. Our gospel, the gospel of Jesus, the proclamation of who He is and what He has done is still the only message that can set the captive free. There is none other. 
We're not getting a new one. This is it. And it is more than a match for any culture. No matter where a man or woman walks, the living Christ wants to encounter them there and redeem them there. It's time for us to get out there. There's still only one message that can set sins captive free. The Bible says you will know the truth. The context of that is not a truth. What people think about truth. How people interpret their own truth. You shall know the truth. There is a truth, an absolute established truth, a transcendent truth, a truth that begins with the truth of God, a truth that starts with the truth that He has established before all time began. There are certain immutable truths that God has communicated to us, and when we know the truth, ultimately fully revealed to us, the fullest re revelation of God in the Scripture, fully revealed to us in Jesus Christ, when we know the truth, that truth alone, alone can make us free. And that message needs a messenger. And the question is quite simple against the backdrop of Rome and fallen cultures and gross immorality and hideous times. Evil men waxing worse and worse against the backdrop of it all. The message simply needs a messenger. Will you be one? You say, oh, I'm, I'm just so intimidated when it, when it comes to anything about, I'm just so intimidated. How much have you prayed? How much have you invested in prayer? See, you're never, you're never going to be used as a witness. You're never going to really be able to, to experience those moments where God, through you, brings liberty to someone else unless you're prayerful. And are you in prayer saying, Lord, I am looking for the opportunity. You get up in the morning, do you look in the mirror and say, you, you are going to touch somebody's life today with the gospel. Your, your going today is going to be the day. Today, somebody's going to come across your path and God is going to use you. He may use you to turn the soil over. He may use you to plant a seed. He may use you in a very subtle... But God is going... To, and unless we are a people who, like William Carey, have our little leather globe that we're turning over constantly saying, Lord, I want to see my world changed. And all the training you might receive will not affect the change you want to see in people's hearts and lives. And this morning, I want to challenge you. I said, the, the message needs a messenger. Are you one? So I want to see everyone. I want to see people's lives change. I want to, I want, will you take the first step? Lord, fill me with your power. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with your joy. Flood me with your word. I want to change my world. I want to change my world. And I'm going to ask some of you this morning to just start picking up some of the cobbled scraps in, in your life and putting them together. You got that kid that's driving you nuts? Time to stitch them into your globe, your little world. You've got a supervisor who's in the same class. Start stitching them into your world. You've got school teachers. Start stitching them into your world. The guy you see on a weekly basis at the restaurant, at the gas station, where, start stitching them into your world. The people that you can't even imagine that God will lead. Lord, I don't know who it will be. Put a big question. I don't know who it will be, but you'll bring somebody across my path. May I be ready. Start stitching them into your world. Begin to pray that the Lord will use you. Little Cora says, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. 
Touch my heart, Lord. Speak through me. Are you willing to be that messenger? Would you stand with me? Sing it with me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me.